Is there a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. 5 0. And we will move on to the consent agenda. There's not much on there tonight. Dr. Cobbs, is there anything you wanted to point out? Nope, should all be fairly, um, fairly succinct there in the, right. in the agenda. Perfect. Um, is I there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Second. Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. And that passes five. We now have Shanda joining us. We were just motioning to pass the consent agenda. Are you voting? Yes. 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 All right. So we've I got six. <laughs> six zero. And Later over there, man. We do not have any comments from the public this evening. Um, we are going to move on to reports and presentations. And first up, we are going to hear um, about um, our students and uh, staff that went to the New York City uh, choir uh, trip. Um, so if you guys would like to come up. Um, Mr. Graff is here, and Mrs. Laird is here, and students, and <laughs> we're so Get glad to have there. you here. Um, we're in uh, not disarray, but Lori is, has, is not feeling well, and she was not able to make it, so her husband, Jeff Underwood, um, delivered some quotes from some students. The students we have here this evening are Josh Richards, um, don't tell me, I'm drawing a blank, Riley, <laughs> Riley Bacon, Mariah Geschwentner, uh, Emma Chidster, Kenan West and Xander Mason, as well as Tammy Laird, the accompanist. Uh, Linda Floyd was one of our parents that went along and tried to help ride herd. Um, so from an administrative standpoint, um, this is a project that, that you guys are aware of. You offered your blessing. What would that have been? Uh, last? Almost a year ago. Yeah, almost a year. And I, I want to tell you, um, it was probably one of the neatest things I know I've been able to do as a, as a school employee with USD 290. Just the opportunity for our kids to, to get in a, a city of that size, to undertake the amount of practice and dedication they had to have to, to, to get to the level of performance they had, and then to just tour New York City, perform at Carnegie Hall, was just phenomenal. Our kids, once they arrived, um, we got there Thursday afternoon, they went through a four-hour practice on Friday, a three-hour practice on Saturday, and then an hour dress rehearsal. So over the course of three days, they had eight hours of practice just to get to perform. So I, I, I'll always remember it. It was just great. So at this time, I'm going to just have these guys step up, and they can share briefly with you guys what their experiences were. <laughs> I guess I'm going first. Um, this was a really cool experience. It was very surreal uh, being in a city that size, I mean, especially having seen it in a variety of different ways on a screen and actually being able to see it with your own eyes in first person is actually really cool. And I think I speak for everybody uh, in the group in saying it was unmatchable uh, of an experience. And uh, it, it was really, I mean, they'll tell you what their favorite parts of it were. I mean, it's going to have something to do with the fact that you can't get it here. I mean, we're proud Kansans all the way around, but I mean, we're, we, there are things about that city that were very cool and having the opportunity to do it was really great. Um, my me, for me specifically, just being able to go to Carnegie, seeing uh, guys like Louis Armstrong and John Lennon having performed on the same stage, that was very surreal for me, uh, being able to be there uh, in that aspect and to that degree, so. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this trip was so phenomenal, like it was so phenomenal that I plan on going back and maybe even moving there. <laughs> like, like, I basically got to see, I got to see some of Manhattan, I got to see some of Queens, and I think some of, 
something else. Um, <laughs> but it was really cool. And Carnegie Hall was Carnegie Hall was so awesome that like the view, just the view from the stage made me want to cry like cuz I know I'll never get that well not never but I know I might not ever get that chance to see that again and I'd have to say my favorite part was the spirit of New York, because, which was the cruise ship, because I got to see the true beauty of New York City. I got to see one of the greatest wonders in the world, the Statue of Liberty. And I got to have fun with my friends. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so from, can I? <laughs> okay. So f we got to see places like Times Square and Central Park. And of course, we got to go on a cruise to see the Statue of Liberty. We got to do all of those things. And I mean, besides just the whole experience from Carnegie Hall, I mean, it was, it was, it was breathtaking. I mean, it was not unlike any place I've ever performed before. And I'm so glad I got to go and see it and actually perform there. And it was an honor. And I would say, besides Carnegie Hall, my favorite part, actually, what, or besides that, of course, because that was amazing, my, <laughs> my favorite part was getting to eat at this diner called Ellen's Stardust Diner. And these waiters and waitresses, they were performing songs like Disney songs and everything. They were actual performers performing for us while we were eating and everything like they were. And they were also, of course, wait, waitressing us and everything. And it was really cool. And turns out those people were some of those people like they said that 17 of those waiters and waitresses that were that waited there um, this past year went to Broadway, like they all perform on Broadway. And so it was so cool to get to be and see these talented, I mean, just extremely like off the wall, talented singers, just, I mean, sing out loud and sing like Disney songs and all of these other songs that we knew. And it was, it was so cool that, that, that it was, it was wonderful. I just, I've never seen anything like it. So that was <laughs> well obviously the trip was great but like let me start from like being with them is great like every day in school this was like the best part of my day being in chamber choir but like going on this trip with them there's no way to explain how I feel <laughs> I think the word's like blessed to go on that trip. And I'm so grateful that I got to experience New York and all the places we went with them. And Carnegie Hall's a huge deal to musicians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tammy Laird and I'm the accompanist for the choir. So I went as the accompanist, but also as a sponsor. Uh, my comments to you are that I began working with the students back when they were still in school as we began working on the Requiem. Um, my part of it ended in that they got to sing with an orchestra, so which was amazing. Um, but I attended each of the rehearsals and my part of that was uh, Mrs. Underwood got to sing. She had the opportunity to sing with the choir. So she was in the choir singing. I was in the background making sure that our students were doing what they were supposed to be doing, that they had everything that they needed, um, and, and that they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. 
And I was so extremely proud of our kids um, at their, the way they were holding their folders during those rehearsals. They stood most of the time during those rehearsals. Um, it, was, it was just amazing. They were well prepared. They knew their music. And as a community, Ottawa should have been extremely proud of each one of these students. I know they are talking about all the fun they had, and it was a lot of fun, and we did have a lot of fun. They were such good people, just good people that were with us. So you would have been, you would have been proud of their preparation, you would have been proud of their performance, and you would have been proud of the people that they were. Um, as a chaperone, we did do a lot of fun stuff, and I had to walk a lot, and my knees will never be the same, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. They did see a lot of wonderful things, but like Mrs. Laird said, there were 17 kids and 15 adults. They were no problem at all. They were respectful. They, were, they stuck with us. They didn't try to do things they shouldn't do. It was wonderful. They were a good group of kids. I would go anywhere with them anytime, even though my granddaughter's one, I'm really not prejudiced. They really are a good group of kids. We didn't lose any of them. I will tell you though, don't try to take 32 people during rush hour traffic at Grand Central Station on the subway, because that was a disaster. Um, they finally just unlocked the gates and wanted us out of there and shoved us through. <laughs> so it was okay. <laughs> but other than that, it was great. We didn't lose anybody except Mr. Graff. <laughs> Where is the uh, Hard Rock Cafe there in Times Square, Mr. Graff? Um, it, it's actually in Times Square. It's not at Radio City Music Hall. <laughs> and, and I actually think I outdid Linda in the number of steps, oh, uh, mainly because I got lost one day. Um, I was being nice, a nice cans and letting someone off the subway train. And unfortunately, uh, a, a man stepped in, and he boxed me out perfectly, and the door shut before I could step out. And it's kind of one of those home alone things. It's like, oh, no, we're OK. I do have a couple quotes I'd like to share with you from some students that couldn't be here. Uh, summarizing experience at Carnegie Hall. Absolutely spectacular. Being on that stage was surreal and truly worth every second of our hard work and dedication to get there. The atmosphere was filled with an enormous amount of passion and devotion for music making Carnegie Hall truly an experience of a lifetime. That was from Nathaniel Schubert. Uh, Teresa Bruna said, it was something I have never experienced before. I just couldn't believe that we had finally made it. When I first walked in there and saw it with my own eyes, I had chills. Uh, Tyler McGee, it was absolutely run wonderful. The acoustics were amazing and the group we sang with sounded fantastic, so beautiful. Uh, those are just some. I can make a copy of these and you guys can look at some of these quotes. I'll email them to Dr. Cobbs and he can pass them out. It, again, it was truly a phenomenal uh, experience. The organization by the group ahead of time uh, to get everyone to and from was phenomenal. I think Times Square was probably an eye-opener for our people. Uh, it's, it's definitely... <laughs> <laughs> it definitely, it's definitely not uh, Main Street on Sidewalk Sale Day here in Ottawa, Kansas. So, again, I, I know on behalf of the choir, I'd like to say thank you for, for the blessing the board gave, for the work that was done uh, to get us there and back safely. It's an opportunity that I don't, I don't think anyone will ever have uh, again. Obviously. So, thank you. Well, I, I was able to go and, and hear the choir sing before they left on the trip on Thursday, and it was beautiful then, so I can't imagine what it would have sounded like with, what, 200 extra voices? Um, yeah, yeah, the <laughs> stage, 160 in the choir, Yeah. and then the orchestra of another, yeah, so it was just phenomenal to, to hear the, everything kind of blend and meld together. Well, all, all I'm thinking is, as you're talking about Carnegie Hall, I hope you're not disappointed with our new Performing Arts Center. <laughs> <laughs> There are, there are lots of neat things going on in our district, and I will tell you that Sunday evening, um, July 7th, there's kind of a thank you reception planned for the Cyclone Room at the high school from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, I don't know all the details, but it might involve some New York-type food, uh, maybe food carts and vendors and those types of things. Uh, so from 6 to 8 on July 7th, if you can put that on your calendar. I know Lori's working behind the scenes to make that happen. So again, thank you very much. We greatly appreciate it. Yeah, a quick question. Is the performance available online or through video recording somewhere? Not yet. They're actually getting to get, okay. Hi, I'm, I'm Jeff Underwood. 
Um, there, uh, Carnegie Hall is rather tight-fisted on how you get recordings from them. I'm sure they are. They don't allow you to record anything during the performances. As a matter of fact, you could see the uh, ushers come down and shut folks down if they saw a phone or something rather. So the, the choirs are, are putting up some money, I guess, to buy the uh, re recording. I don't know the full details. Of course, my wife does. So. Okay. And I'd, I'd like to just say, this was an awesome group. I've traveled a lot with different performing groups over the years, and these guys were just great. Uh, one thing they didn't, a couple things they didn't mention is they performed it in the Empire State Building for all the folks coming around, and there were people from many different places wor worldwide videoing them, you know, take pictures. They did an awesome job there. And that was after we were on the 86th floor, so that was, you know. <laughs> And uh, also, we took them, took them to the 9/11 memorial, oh, which was uh, you know, I, I, it was definitely worth the trip. It's it's a very somber thing, and I have very uh, re memories of that time that were brought back. So it was it was had a lot of meaning, but I think it had a lot of meaning for the kids yeah. too, most of who weren't even born then. So, but uh, all in all, uh, I, I think know, this was great. an outstanding trip, and uh, I'm sure the kids will will uh, attest to that too, and have. So and you, you said you sang a requiem. Which one? Requiem for the Living by Dan Forrest. Okay. Dan Forrest, actually, uh, my wife knew him, uh, knows him. He was getting his doctorate at KU when uh, Lori was getting her master's. And he also uh, had some connection here to Ottawa. Had to do... Calgary yeah, Calgary Baptist Church. They ran like a church camp or something, he and his wife. Mm -hmm. So right here in Ottawa. And uh, she Fun. was corresponding back and forth with Dan too. He lives in Connecticut now and he was sorry he couldn't make it to the performance. But uh, so a very good local connection to a actually world renowned composer. So it's very cool. Well on a, on a it's a small world note, Jackie Steelman who teaches fourth grade at Garfield was at the Empire State Building and just missed you guys. Oh, just missed oh. hearing you sing. Thank you all again. This was an awesome yeah. experience. Well I'm hoping that this is the start of something wonderful in our community. And between the band and the choir, I'm hoping we can continue sending groups out. And thank you for being really one of the first groups in a long time uh, in the fine arts department that has represented us very well. Um, it takes a lot. I know that because I've done that um, as a student, not as a parent yet. But, um, and I remember the fun that I had and the memories that I have. And you know, that was almost 30 years ago. So it'll stay with you. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming and sharing that with us. All right. We are going to uh, move on here to elementary building review. We have Mrs. Fanning, Mrs. Schaefer, and Mr. Entrust to present their end of the year building reports. Really? You got to. Yeah. I don't want to. It's not my favorite thing. All right. I'm going to go ahead and start. And some of this you have already heard, so I'm not going to repeat or beat a dead horse. So I want to go ahead and get started with. Okay, which one is? Right. There we go. All right, so some things that we are doing in all of our elementaries is we've implemented FNP, the Fontas and Pinnell for Reading in grades K-3. Well-managed schools, we are all having our morning meetings and talking about the skills um, needed for kids. There are 16 of them we focus on all year long and we do that every morning uh, with our students. Uh, adding the social workers this year, we've worked on a strategic plan. Um, one of the biggest things that we've done is looking at standards-based grading that we're going to implement this next year in all of our grade levels and um, looking at various mathematical pr uh, practices. So with that, I know that you've already seen this data, so I wanted just to go ahead and make sure we included that to show that we have all, um, all our elementaries here together. Well, something I want to share about this is first and third, as you look at map data for math, we have uh, first and third meeting the norms for spring, first, third, and fifth met their growth 
targets. Second missed it by two tenths of a point, and fourth missed it by one point six or one and six tenths. So, but all are in with, within the standard deviation. And with that, at the far right, you see over there, basically a standard. The standard deviation says on any given day they could score less than or more than um, that RIT score based on however they're doing that day. So all of our scores fall within, and I believe in all of our buildings within standard deviation. Reading, third and fourth met uh, or exceeded the norms. Second, missed it by seven tenths. Uh, I think there was one other first grade, missed it by five tenths uh, and fifth by one. First, second, and third met their growth. Forced, fourth grade missed it by eight tenths of a point and fifth grade missed it by two and one tenth. Um, again, all are within standard deviation and you'll hear some more information from each of the elementaries as we talk specifically about our buildings. So we'll start with Garfield. So Garfield, our um, motto is, or our vision statement, Garfield team members are active learners who are responsible, respectful, and safe. We say it every single morning, all of our skills focus around that. Uh, if you stopped a kid in the hallway, they'd be able to share their vision statement and why it's important and what they're doing at that time that represents one of those things. I have to share quickly that little girl in the far, your left, um, kindergarten studies in science, wood and trees and then therefore paper and so what they did is they learned how to make particle board so they talked about what a tree was how it's used and then they actually took um, various types of wood and then they created um, particle board pressed it she decided to make a snowman out of her piece of particle board that she had um, and she for um, some formed uh, little pieces of wood, some wrote on it, some for little sculptures, but they learned about the process involved in creating something like that from the beginnings of a tree in kindergarten, which I thought was pretty awesome. So looking at math for Garfield, some of the things that I, I just want you to kind of take into consideration as you look at the scores, and I will go through this, and if you have questions, by all means, just stop me. Um, looking at math scores, uh, third grade, I want to make note of third grade. They are closing the map scores gap. Um, in second grade, they were behind um, growth or growth target by two and one tenth. This year, they were above it by two and a third or two, two and three tenths of a point. So they are growing, which is what we want our kids to do. Yes, we want them all to be at uh, norm, but we want our kids to grow because not all kids are there. But if they're showing that growth, that's important as well. And again, they all fall within um, the standard deviation. Wanted to show you the growth map. First grade's not on there because this growth is shown from beginning of the year to the end, but I did want to make a note and let you know that that first grade, their growth is supposed to be from middle to end 7.7, .7, and they made eight points worth of growth. So they did grow the way they should have. Um, what I do want to note also on fifth grade is I want to let you know that math is difficult. We all know, we've talked about this forever, that interventions are, are not what we want them to be. We really need to shore those up. Mrs. Bybee's doing a great job with our math cadre and getting us together, looking at our standards, looking for some great resources for that. So we're really very excited about what the future holds for math and our kiddos. Some things that Garfield will be doing next year is we're going to have wind time. We've scheduled time within our day um, it's called what I need and so there'll be intervention and enrichment time and I'll elaborate on that a little more as we go through this as well we have kids that are not quite making it so we'll have uh, half an hour for them to go specifically to a place where they need what'll be nice is our all of our teachers in the um, intermediate grades third, third through fifth we'll have that in the morning at the same time our specials teachers uh, PE music they will also have time to take kids and do some enrichment. One of the things that um, our music teacher is wanting to do is have uh, uh, an honors choir. She's wanting to, uh, she's writing a grant for ukuleles. She's wanting to have a mallet ensemble. So um, each special is doing something specific and exciting. Then at the same time, we have our regular ed teachers also able to pull some of those kids out and work specifically in areas of need, whether it's math or reading. These are not meant to be, um, you're here forever because we know kids that are not always um, 
needing a specific intervention all year long, I uh, equate it to like a, a pothole. You fill that pothole, they move on and they're doing great. So they may not need to be there all year. So um, wanted to share the win time that we'll have for both reading and for math. And I want to speak a little bit to uh, the scores, the students that didn't meet or didn't meet their growth norm. Um, there's something I want to speak to a little later as far as our behavior screener data that I found interesting that I want to share with you as well. So looking at math, when you look at math for the state assessments, um, fourth grade is closing their gap. As third graders, they were 18 points behind the state. As third graders this year, they are behind, but they were only five points behind. So closing that gap, making some strides. Again, not where we would love them to be, but making some growth in that area. So did not show it on the map, but definitely showed it on the state assessments. And two very different assessments. Some of the things I've already talked about, um, having the flexible schedule with the win time. We are also going to be working with TASN. Um, Kansas has a technical assistant team that works with schools, um, focusing on uh, support and implementation of standard, or excuse me, uh, research-based practices. And so we're working with TASN to do some of those things in each of our buildings. So I um, wanted to share that. And then again, fifth grade. I was very excited about the growth they made in math. I, I forgot to say that. I really feel like it's due to goal setting they started to make. Fifth grade specifically targeted each unit before they went into it, assessed themselves, themselves, charted their own progress as they took their assessments, decided what it was they needed to work on, and, and marked that throughout the, um, throughout the unit and did it all year long. So the kids having ownership of their scores and what they had and where they were going was pretty powerful. So looking at reading, um, met norms in all of our areas, but second grade, and they missed that by three tenths of a point. Um, again, falling within their standard deviation, of course, in all those areas. Um, let me see here. First, second, and third grades exceeded their projected growth on their MAP assessments. Um, if you look at, and that was the growth that I was talking about, so. Um, high, and something interesting about fourth and fifth grade as far as the growth there. We have some very high readers in fourth and fifth grade. Some of those kids did not make the growth that we wanted them to make in reading. And there, there's, there's a couple things we want to look at. One we are looking at is the amount of growth they're supposed to make based on um, their grade level and the reading level. Some of our kids are reading beyond the, what the MAP score has as a norm. So they're reading beyond 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th grade levels. So we want to go back, and this is part of our win time, we want to make sure we have that time for those kids that are reading at a higher level, some enrichment. What are we doing for those kids that are reading at those higher levels? So providing that win time for those kids um, and being able to slide them into those areas and, and work on some of that is something we want to do as well. And do it in a way that's fun. I mean, we don't want to take a student and put them into um, a half hour, 45 minutes of, you know, None of us want to sit through that and, and the, the drudgery of you know, getting something pounded into us. We want it to be exciting. We want the learning to be fun, and, and enrichment should be fun. So we're really excited about that. First grade, not on here. Um, they were supposed to make 6.8 um, points worth of growth. They made 10 from uh, winter to spring. Let's see, third grade in the state assessments scored above the state in reading. Uh, fourth and fifth grade did score below, fifth grade by one point though. Um, so we really did like to see, see that. Again, we want it to be um, there or beyond, of course. So those are definitely things we need to look at and work on. And not just look at the state assessments. We need to look at the state assessments. We need to look at the map. We need to look at classroom performance. It's not just one test or one and done. It is all those things. And we look at all those things in conjunction with each other. As I mentioned before, we are going to be doing flexible time. There will be that win time also for um, the kids for reading, it's going to be the same time. So a student could come out for math, um, they could come out for reading, uh, had the question, what if they need both? We're gonna take what's most important first. And typically right now, I mean, we all know that reading, if we can get some reading in, we can get a lot of other things under that umbrella as well. So um, we'll have to look at what's most important for that student at that time. 
Looking at science, uh, state science assessment scores, fifth grade did a fantastic job on that. Um, I'm going to equate that to they had not only science class with FOSS, which I think is awesome because it hits those state standards wonderfully, but they also had a class called STEM that Mrs. Streeter taught. And so they had kind of a double dose of science in their afternoon. And so she connected what they were doing in science with STEM and that uh, engineering mindset. So <clears throat> this base data, when you looked at it, I'm sure you're going, what the heck is this? So what we um, have done, our counselors and social workers this year decided to do something a little different when we're looking at behavior screeners. We've had the SRSS IE in the past. What they wanted to do is really look at the 16 areas that we are focusing on, focusing on for well-managed schools and how can we incorporate that into the screener so we can say specifically what do kids need assistance with and we can form then tier two and tier three groups as needed based on that information. Um, the academic behaviors, I didn't include that on my data. Those are things I feel like, um, and I'm not sure if Shannon feels the same way. Shannon and I both um, showed this data this year. Um, Austin wanted to uh, show his data from SRSS IE from last year to this year, which is great, but we didn't include the academic because Personally, I feel like those are things we do in class every single day. We work on in tier one, staying on task, working independently, following instructions. So Shannon and I really wanted to focus on the social and then the emotional behaviors. So there were a list of different things and they're all labeled. So under social behaviors, I know you can read, so the accepting no. They take, took that scale, so they look specifically at a student. So if I had Shannon as a student, does she accept no? And I might have, a, well I do, I have a zero to three. Is, does she never accept no? Does she one sometimes and all the way up to three almost always? So they did that for every single student in their classroom. And with that information, for social behaviors, this is how Garfield stacked up. So what you want is um, you want 80% of your students to be tier one 15% of them to be tier two, and 5% to be, well, you don't want anybody in tier, but really, realistically, that's where they fall. 5% typically fall into that tier three, needing lots of intervention. Um, we fell into all those categories pretty darn well. Um, didn't really have much of an issue in any of those. And with those specific things up above, so accepting no, working well with others, able to control temper, does not mean we didn't have issues with those. We all have issues with those. We have those outliers that we have um, concerns with, but there weren't in an abundance that they reflected within our data. For emotional behaviors, we look at things like managing their emotions, appears happy, adapts to change, positive attitude. It's interesting because when you look at um, the scores for those, kindergarten through third grade really do follow the, the trend they're supposed to, fourth and fifth we found very interesting. So um, when I looked specifically, because I thought that was very, very odd, when I looked specifically at what it was the teachers marked, um, and they do this independently. This is not I'm sitting down and we're going to do this all together as a team. Each teacher does their own class on their own time. Anxiety was the, the number one that came out of every, every classroom in both grade levels. And so when I think about anxiety, when I go back to the teachers and we share this information, one of the things I'd really think would be important to talk about, and I will send and talk to Charlie about, is our fourth graders going into fifth grade? Do they have anxiety for testing? Do they get anxiety with new things? Is there anxiety when you know there's a change in anything in the class? So that needs to be a tier one, whole class type of um, topic that we address. And let's see how that helps with our assessment scores next year. I'm just, I'm just kind of curious, but I found that very interesting that they all came out anxiety, and then I think I marked another one. Managing emotions came out as third, and then interacting positively with others was another one. Um, but Far and away, anxiety was the highest score, which I found was very interesting. So what are we going to do with this? We're going to take this back. Teachers did this at the end of the year. So I've compiled the data. We take this back, share this with them. They look at it, and then they have um, conversations, and we start forming groups for a social worker, for a counselor, and, um, and for that win time, what I need. If there's a student that has a tier three need during that win time, then that's a great time for the social worker or the counselor to pull them out and do an intervention with them. All right, and I think that's all I have. Questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Okay, well, I will try my best to hit on um, things that Mr. Schaefer has not touched on yet and look specifically just at sunflower data. The first four slides are um, all about math. So if you look, um, first grade is new this year. We have not tested MAP for first grade until this year. <coughs> we decided to do that in the winter, mostly because we feel like um, first grade teachers need just a little bit more um, data. First grade teachers were on board and said, yes, let's do it. So this was the first time that we had tested first grade in USD 290, I think ever. Uh, we, we may have tried it one year. We did try it one year many years ago um, and opted not to do it for a long time. And so we brought it back. Um, so it is a little bit interesting to see that data. But first grade, third grade, and fifth grade in the area of math all, um, all met projected um, norms or above it. Um, our second grade and our fourth grade aren't quite there in the areas of math. Um, I will say that meeting with my building leadership team, um, my fifth grade very consistently and from the very beginning of school did math intervention groups. Um, they also supplemented a little bit with some spiraling type of programming where they weren't just teaching to mastery and then they move on to a totally different skill and don't come back to it they came back to those skills over and over again. It was something that our building leadership team talked about a lot um, at the end of school and this summer in preparation for next year. Um, definitely a consideration we'd like Math Cadre to look at as we're adopting curriculum um, for next year. So even though our second grade and our fourth grade are just a little bit below the norm in MAP, on MAP, when we show the growth, they did meet their projected growth, which means they started out fairly far behind and they're making up that ground. They are closing that gap. Um, they're, they're just not there yet. Um, and so we feel really good about the fact that, that we're making good gains. Um, the next slide I wanted to show you is where we were last year and where we are this year. Part of the reason is um, this really made our building le leadership team pretty proud. Um, if you look on the left-hand side where the green bar, the purple one right underneath it is the district, and the bottom one is the state. We were pretty far behind in third grade and in fourth grade, and fifth grade did pretty well last year. Last year, it took us a while to start gaining some momentum. When we came together as a brand new school, it took a little bit to get to know each one of those kids. Um, about 70% of our kids at Sunflower were new to our staff. They came from a variety of different places. Um, over the course of the last year, when you look at what's on the right, that's this year's scores. So third grade, we are above both state and district average. Our fourth grade is a little bit below, but if you look at them as third graders, they were 10 points below, and now they're only six. So they are still closing that gap, even though, again, they're not quite up to the state average. And fifth grade, we're above the state average. So we feel good about that. So we still have a little ways to go in some areas, but feel really good about the growth that we've made over the last year. As we're looking at um, some of our considerations, one of the things that we really need to focus on is that fourth grade group. Um, that fourth grade group didn't quite meet state expectations or the state average. Um, and so really targeting um, not just their intervention, but their core math, make sure that they are getting that spiraling. Um, we're pretty anxious for TASN to come in. We started working with them at the end of the year. And any ideas that we can get for more refined intervention techniques, um, I think will specifically help um, this group of students. We'd also like to look at ways to provide enrichment. Um, we've talked about it as a building leadership team. Um, I think it's one of the areas that is challenging for staff um, to teach not only those students that are needing the support and the intervention and your grade level students, but really trying to push those upper level, um, those students that are already exceeding expectations. And then the next slides are specifically about reading. Um, again, we feel pretty good about our data. Um, in the area of reading, we have met norms in every grade level. 
as well as meeting expected growth. And when you look at our reading scores, we are above the state average in third grade, at the state average in fourth grade, and still falling just a little bit behind in that fifth grade. But again, that fifth grade group still meeting their expected growth. So they are making the gains appropriate to catch up. Um, one of the things that we've really talked about as a building leadership team is the implementation of Fountas and Pinnell over the course of the last year and really looking closely at those scores and how they've started to impact our kindergartners, our first graders, our second graders, and our third graders. And our fourth and fifth grade teachers are really anxious and excited to get started with Fountas and Pinnell. Um, I was a third grade teacher for many years and as an intermediate teacher, you don't get as much refined training in the area of reading as you really need. And so our fourth and fifth grade teachers are very anxious to learn more about guided reading, to really look at what they can do to help reach students in the area of reading. Fountas and Pinnell is really rich in literature, um, and so they're very anxious to get that into their classroom and, again, make any necessary changes um, through TAS and to our intervention model. Um, Science, we were just a little bit disappointed only because we were about where we needed to be last year and saw a little bit of a dip. We're right at the district average, um, but fallen just a little bit short there. So focusing on FOSS for next year, I think, would be um, important. And then I took our social and our emotional um, screener, like Mrs. Schaefer was talking about just a little bit ago, and just wrote down for you really the areas in each grade level um, that were areas of strength or areas that we needed to look at for improvements. And it was very interesting to me as I really started looking at that data that the area of strength for every grade level was able to control temper. And then you're, you can see some of the other ones, kind of a mix, um, accepts consequences is another one that went ranked really high. And areas for improvement problem solver in social situations came up at every grade level, which is interesting. A um, Couple of things just to be thinking about um, in terms of that social emotional piece at Sunflower. Um, we had hired a social or a school psychologist at the beginning of last year, and that um, person that we hired had some health issues and was not physically able to come to work. So we thought she was going to be able to come to work, and we kind of just kept holding out hope. Um, she was never able to um, join us. And so we had to figure out how to fill that school psychologist role, which was a little challenging. Um, thank goodness for Casey Evans and Jolene Senna, who came over and helped us, but they were not full-time in our building. Um, they definitely were spread pretty thin. Another thing to consider is we had hired um, someone for our um, upper grades in special education. That person quit in December or January, I can't remember which, January, I think. And so we had a turnover of staff mid-year, and so we um, brought back a previous employee. She was willing to come back and join us. Um, so we had some challenges um, being able to try to address some of these things. Um, we did have Sally Crawford Fowler join us as a part-time social worker, which was a tremendous help. Um, and very anxious that next year we should have a full-time social worker as well as a full-time school psychologist at Sunflower. In the emotional piece, um, you can see that on the left, the areas of strength were adapt to change. Um, and several times you'll see manages emotions and also appears happy, which are great things. And the areas to improve when you specifically look at the data, every one of those, every grade level is free from anxiety, is the thing to improve. So one of the things that I would definitely suggest um, to Mrs. Stipe as she gets started with the team next year is really to get that full-time social worker and school psychologist involved and really look at what are some um, techniques to help students deal with anxiety, figuring out how to bring those into um, the lessons that they're teaching, bring those into tier two and tier three groups, um, 
and really look at refining that Boys Town language. I think all of that um, can really help in some of those areas. Questions for me before I turn it over to Austin? Thank you. Good evening. You don't want my notes, huh? I, I could read your notes if you want to. I mean, you can. Okay. All right, we have obviously some great pictures up here. I do want to say that no students were harmed in the making of these pictures. As you see, Andrew Patterson being held up there by Darnell Johnson. That was when Mr. Johnson was trying to cheat in our horse game that we play with staff. Uh, so he was trying to dunk. And so thankfully, he got Andrew down safely, and, and he did not win. That was Miss Buckles who won the championship. We will move on from there. Um, we have, just as Mrs. Schaefer and Mrs. Fanning have, we have our math data, our state assessment data, a variety of pieces to share with you. When I move to the considerations page for math, that's when I'm going to talk to you about the map data that is up here. And I did add um, just yearly growth and yearly growth norm into this slide. As you can see, this graphic that you have is based on a mean. This slide back here, we are showing you the median scores. So as you can tell, there's a little bit of differences as far as the growth from year to year based upon the graphics that are shown on this slide and then the previous one. In state assessment scores, um, we do still have work that we would like to do at Lincoln in regards to our state assessment scores. I am proud to say that in two of our three grade levels, our scores did improve. Um, but also, we would definitely like to be closer to that state average than we are currently. In addition, though, I would like to point out that for our state assessments, we purposely did our state assessments as early as we could to ensure that we had time in between our state assessments and then our MAP assessments at the end of the year. So we did take our reading state assessments before spring break, um, and then we finished up actually just two weeks after spring break to allow plenty of time before we took MAP at the end of the year. Math considerations. Talking more specifically about MAP, we did have two grade levels that were right at or above the spring norms. That was first and third grade, and then fourth grade was just off at 1.5. We did have a wide number of grades who met or exceeded their yearly growth norms. That was first, second, third, and fourth. Fifth was close, they were 0.9 points off. In comparison to last year's yearly growth norms, Second, fourth, and fifth grades impre increased their grade levels growth from the previous year. Third grade I like to highlight as well. Uh, third grade students in second grade were 3.1 points away um, from the national norm and then at in third grade they were 0.4 points off. So they showed a lot of growth in that third grade even though they were not exactly right where we wanted them to be. Math Leadership Institute, we had over the course of this year and last year, we've now been able to have kindergarten, first, second, third, and fourth grade teachers be able to attend that Math Leadership Institute in Emporia through the Jones Institute and Dr. Coaster. They have been a great resource for not only our building as they come back and visit with the rest of their team member, members and their PLC, but also been able to share some of their knowledge gained with district committees as they're all on that math cadre, and also they've helped to provide some district PDs to the rest of the district. One of the th the key pieces that they took on this year as they went to that training was that part of what they have learned through the Math Leadership Institute is our students need a lot more hands-on than we're currently getting within my math. So each one of those Math Leadership Institute representatives came back and they helped lead the purchase of $250 worth of manipulatives to use this year uh, with our students so that way they could get definitely some more concrete operational skills in their hands. As far as looking forward to next year, Professional learning communities, this will be fantastic to have these scheduled back into the day. Uh, we have teachers who love to be able to visit with their colleagues, and that'll be fantastic to have those teachers have that time built back into every week to focus on those four essential questions. That math leadership team for next year, they were able to go to that training without having a time built into the schedule. We did not, we we're not able to meet as a math leadership team at the building as much as we wanted, but next year having that time on Fridays, we'll be able to meet more regularly than we did this current year to make sure that we continue to push those mathematical practices to the rest of their teammates. Additionally, these five teachers will continue their work on the district math cadre as a new math adoption is researched. It was mentioned already with Mrs. Fanning and Mrs. Schaefer, we are definitely looking forward to our work with TASN as we look to different, to, uh, having some different tiered instruction for math. As we move to reading, once again, I'll mention these MAP scores as we come to the, map, or to the reading considerations. As we go to the Lincoln State Assessment scores, once again, we had two of our three grade levels who showed increase from last year, but we do still have work that we need to get done to improve our state assessment scores. When we focus on those MAP scores, 
We had first, second, third, and fourth grade who were at or above the spring norms. As far as the yearly growth norms, second and third grade uh, were met or exceeded. Second, fourth, and fifth also increased their grade levels growth from the previous year. Once again, closing the gap, third grade students, when they were in second grade, they were 0.7 points off of the norm where they needed to be at. And then in third, they were two points ahead. So they showed 2.7 uh, growth in comparison to where they were the previous year in regards to the rest of the nation. I do want to take a moment here to highlight the, the extensive work that our title staff has done and give a chance here to show some of the gains that they have, that have seen in their students that they have serviced. So as we look at each one of those grade levels, the first one that shows is the work with their th tier three students. So the students that they work with in the smallest groups, sometimes even one-on-one. -on -one. Um, for our second grade tier three students, those students had 4.3 points over the norm for their growth for the year, so definitely something to be celebrated. For our tier, stu stu tier two students, they were eight points above the yearly growth norm. In third grade, that growth continued in tier three, 2.7 above. In tier two, 7.7. And then as we noticed in a couple of the other um, slides as well, fourth and fifth grade, it can just be more difficult to get those same gains in reading. Um, so we did not see that massive amount of growth that we saw in second and third grade, but we did still have students in tier three in fourth grade who were right at that national average as far as what they should grow for the year. We did have students in tier two who, who exceeded that growth for the year. And then in tier three and fifth grade, we were negative 2.6 points off and negative 3.1 points off in tier two. Reader Recovery Edition, we were definitely very thankful to add Susie Hedrick this year and be able to have our second trained Reader Recovery teacher. Between her and Kim Fisher, we were able to have 16 students service within Reading Recovery. Why that is outstanding, Reading Recovery is probably the most intensive intervention that we have for reading in this district. We have 30 minutes daily where a student works one-on-one -on -one with a trained reading specialist every single day. So by adding that second Reading Recovery teacher, that allowed eight more students in first grade to have that Reading Recovery experience and then also we scheduled in a time for our second grade students to go back and work with their last year's teacher with Mrs. Fisher and with Mrs. Hedrick so that way they could continue to push those reading recovery practices that they had in first grade. So we see a lot of growth with those first grade students when they're reading recovery. We wanted to schedule that time as second graders that we could make sure that we could continue to catch them up with those teachers again. As far as for next year, we've already talked PLC and what that will bring and why we're excited to have that back. Founders Pinnell Classroom has been talked about. One thing that I do want to mention, not only are we bringing that into fourth and fifth grades, but also kindergarten, first, second, and third grade will have the materials at the beginning of the year. So that is outstanding. We would love to say that we would have those fourth and fifth grade materials at the beginning of the year but I've been trying to be cautious with my teachers saying we'll get them hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, but it'll be outstanding to have those materials and hit the ground running with that. Tiered instruction and in, in title. Um, I Space can sometimes be helpful, and so our title classroom teachers, you may not be aware, but they have been working exclusively out of our group rooms at the end of the building. They now have back a classroom setting where they are gonna move into one of our open kindergarten classrooms, and that will be a great setting to minimize the distractions and also for some of our younger students make a much simpler transition. A kindergarten student walking from one end of the building all the way down to the other group room takes a lot longer. Having a kindergarten classroom and just moving right next door to receive title instruction it, it will expedite that imme immensely, how quickly we'll be able to come in and come back to class. Tiered instruction as well, as mentioned down there, it's kind of cut off down at the bottom, but our work with TASN will be great to focus back in on our tiered instruction and what other things that we can possibly do. As far as state assessments in science, this was, we went down. There's no other way of saying it. In fifth grade, our, our scores went from 289 last year to 285. Um, that is definitely something that I'm hopeful that with some additional new staff members this year that we can hit the ground running in science. Um, they did show gains in fifth grade in reading and math in comparison to last year, but we did go down in science. Now this data, the basis um, assessment that Mrs. Fanning and Mrs. Schaefer explained to you is a great assessment. Our school social workers and counselors did a fantastic job of, of making something that fits within Boys Town. The reason why I chose not to have our teachers do that this spring is I really wanted to have a look at something where we were able to look at how our students grew over the course of the school year. So already all of our schools gave the SRSS at the fall and the winter benchmarking periods. I wanted to make sure that we also gave it in the spring. The 
reason why I want to do that is after a year of implementation in Boys Town, I wanted to make sure that we could take a, a pretty good look at how that impacted our students. So the two graphs on the one on the left and the one in the middle, those are our externalizing um, screener results from this year, winter and spring. I didn't include fall in there as fall is kind of in a honeymoon period, so I would say a more realistic indication of where our students were at would have been those winter scores. So I'll talk about those as I move to the behavior considerations, but I just wanted you to get an idea of, of where we're coming from. The one on the left, one in the middle, or from this year. In comparison to really see what Boys Town has done for our students, I have then our spring results from last year. Same thing for internalizing behaviors. Externalizing behaviors are the ones that you're going to see more prevalent in the classroom. Those are things that usually get a teacher's attention and attention in their classroom uh, or classmates. Internalizing behaviors are usually those ones that, like were mentioned earlier, anxiety, those things that can cause a student to have have some struggles but be a little bit more where it's not as easily seen by a teacher or by classmates. So those considerations, winter to spring. Kindergarten and fifth grade showed improvement in their SRSS scores in externalizing behaviors. First, second, and fourth grade stayed relatively the same, while third grade did show increased behaviors from winter to spring. Winter to spring internalizing behaviors. Kindergarten, first, second, and fourth Kindergarten, first, second, fourth, and fifth showed improvement. The only one that did not show that improvement was once again third. They showed an increased behaviors of concern, which I, I would say that both that increase in behaviors of concern and externalizing and internalizing were some things that we were seeing at the end of the school year with some of our third grade students. So those do make sense. As we look at spring 2018 to spring 2019, in almost every grade across the board, this year's scores showed an improvement in comparison to last year in both externalizing and internalizing behaviors, especially in Tier 3. That was really the meat of why I wanted to make sure that we gave that spring assessment in the SRSS as opposed to bases. Moving forward, we will definitely use bases, but I wanted to make sure that we took a moment to give the assessment that we had done through all the other ports of the year so we could really get a summative look at how Boys Town impacted our kids. Morning meeting was something new to our building this year. This was a scheduled flexible period for the first 30 minutes of every day which really allowed our teachers to focus on social emotional growth of students. This is where we taught Boys Town social skills. This is where we had our growth mindset instruction. This is also where we did team building activities within the classroom and then this is also where we introduced our buddy classrooms. Buddy classrooms were just where we teamed up kindergarten and third grade together, first and fourth and then th uh, second and fifth grade together so we could really get some mentoring and then also I think it's great for our older kids to see just some of the excitement of some of our younger kids. So those buddy classrooms were scheduled during that time as well. Moving forward to next year, Boys Town instruction. We've talked about this through the other slides, uh, but there will need to be some continued refinement of our social skills instruction, plan teaching, corrective strategies, check in, check out supports, just basically continuing to focus on that Boys Town instruction, making sure that we are utilizing it the best that we possibly can to improve the social emotional learning of our students. Morning me meeting will continue to be utilized. The great part about next year's morning meeting though, however, will be morning meeting was also a time that we utilized to schedule in our PLC meetings. Since we did not have those built into our schedule this year, we had a rotating basis where we had specials teachers and title staff go in and cover morning meeting in the morning while those teachers could then come out and have PLC time. With PLC time being built back into the day, that is now just a sacred time where teachers can have their students first thing in the morning, which it will allow for, for a much better opportunity for those students to learn, uh, having their teachers stay in the classroom right away every, every day instead of taking them away for PLC time. Buddy classrooms as well, we used that time in the morning to, to have meetings as I had mentioned, so sometimes we pulled some buddy classroom teachers away. This next year, this, the, that time being added in will allow us to have all of our teachers in for buddy classrooms, which will be helpful as well. Base screener, it'll be great to give that assessment fall, winter, and spring of next year. I think it is definitely better aligned to Boys Town skills and be able to give some better feedback to our teachers about what our students will actually, will, will definitely need to improve on in the classroom. And then also, I just threw in there, we are, we have added a second recess for fourth and fifth grade. I throw that in this behavior slide just because it is always great to get kids up and moving and get blood flow into the body, so I'm excited to add that second recess for fourth and fifth grade and I'm even more excited to say that that second recess will be on brand new playgrounds and so if you have driven by Lincoln this week uh, the city has been taking apart the primary playground so that is exciting because that means that shortly we'll be able to have new playgrounds being put in their place. 
All right, district initiatives to consider moving forward for next year. Actually, I'll stop here. Any questions specific to Lincoln? I just want to then say I, I thank you for that opportunity to share that with you. There is a lot of, of extremely hard work by all of our staff, so I definitely want to take a moment to thank the Lincoln staff for all the hard work that they did this year. Make sure that you know that I appreciate everything that they do, and I know that you guys do the same. Um, we have great students, great staff, and it is a, it's a blessing to be able to work there. Um, district initiatives for next year, we've mentioned this already, found us Spinell classrooms in grades four through five, uh, continuing to strengthen the consistency and fidelity to well-managed schools in Boys Town. PLC work will be huge. Having that time built back in every single week will be amazing, um, and that will really allow our colleagues to, to spend that time in conversation with each other on, on what our students need to learn. Implementation of the strategic plan. Our teachers have they spent such a, a great amount of time this year in helping to craft that strategic plan. All of our initiatives that we are wanting to take on for the next couple of years are all in that document. Having the teachers be able to have a hand in that creation is great and then that also just lays out kind of the playbook for where we're going to go for the next couple of years. Implementation and use of standards-based grading practices. I believe Carmen had mentioned that but that'll be fantastic for all of our grades to be in standards-based grading. Utilization of effective mathematical practices and then that partnering with TASN to strengthen our intervention protocols. And that will be in a nutshell what happens at elementary next year. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. You're remote. All right, we are moving to. Come on, I appreciate you staying through. Richard's family, thank you. Thank you for going to New York and thank you for representing our kids. Thank you. All right, let's talk about the strategic plan for a little bit. We're going to start with goal three. All right, and I just want to scroll through this. Keep scrolling down there for me. I just want to make sure that we can see all of the accomplishments that we have, we have um, uh, taken on so far as we've worked through the strategic plan. Remember, the strategic plan is less than a year old, and some of these things we've already implemented and put into place and have become um, distinct within our building. So the first there, improving the social-emotional well-being of our kids. We've implemented Boys Town, and it has become a part of who we are. There's a, a piece that we have to recognize within this. Action 1 says all staff will be trained in the Boys Town model, and we're still having some discussions on what and if that might look like um, at the secondary level, how it changes from a well-managed school platform, K through pre-K through 5, and what it looks like at the secondary level, 6 through 8. There are certainly pieces that we need to implement throughout, although there's still some discussions of what it looks like all the way through K-12. Um, but the other things there we have accomplished. USD 290's trained Boys Town trainer. We had five of them go through uh, here in the last couple months. Um, and we have also started revisiting that Boys Town training because we have those trainers on site. So now we have this constant, uh, this constant process that we can go through. We also had somebody come in and do an audit of our Boys Town skills and talk about these things were going well, these things were not going well, how we can improve that process. If you look at what we've done with Engage, we went from Engage housing only six through eight to now housing elementary students as well and creating a very different environment there. Um, and we've started working through some of those things as to how we really develop what Eugene Field looks like and quit thinking about Eugene Field solely as the Engage program. There are nearly 100 students that utilize Eugene Field every, each and every day as a means to, to address their education. Uh, and our intent there is to envelop all of them and, and quit thinking of our alternative schools as a silo and thinking about as a different means to an end, how we get those students in and out of our schools to meet their needs. Maybe they don't work in, in the, the static environment of OHS or OMS or any of our elementary schools all day long, but maybe some of their, their coursework takes place within Eugene Field. Some of it takes place in our other buildings and we work back and forth in doing some of those things. The trauma-informed care piece of this um, we, want to, we want to make sure that we address from an understanding that not all of the trauma-informed care teams are going to look exactly the same. The way that the middle school has created their program works well for the middle school, um, but it has been enveloped in a different way at our elementary schools through the SIT process and through the well-managed schools program. So the way that we talk about trauma-informed care and the trauma-informed care team at the middle school is a little bit different than what we're seeing at the elementary schools. The purpose and the point that we're trying to get 
get to is that we begin to recognize that each of our kids come to us each and every day with some things happening in their life. And some of the behaviors that they exude and the choices they make may be a result of some of those things that are taking place in their personal lives and not necessarily a normal reaction for them in the, in the course of a typical day. So being able to recognize those things and having the right people in place will help us address some of those things and we can do so throughout. And then of course the social workers. We hired our third social worker. We'll have a full-time social worker at each of our elementary schools. Uh, this is a, a huge piece for us uh, moving forward and ultimately beginning to address some of those behaviors at the, at the lower levels as kids build into, into the secondary system. And then of course the MTSS program, which is TAS. And you heard our, our elementary principals talk a lot about their excitement about getting TAS to come in. Um, and looking at our, our multi-tiered systems of support process and our intervention is really going to have a huge impact upon where we go. Goal three, we have begun to address or have implemented all facets of goal three to this point. It is not to say that we are done with our work, but I did want to make sure that everybody sees that each and every one of those goals are being addressed in our building and continuing to develop as we move through. Any questions on goal three? The, the behaviors that they've addressed, mm -hmm. um, I, I find interesting that every elementary school noticed anxiety. Mm -hmm. yep. Do we have something specific in our strategic plan to help address some of that anxiety, whether it's towards testing, whether it's just kids having too much screen time, whether it's family environment? It, it is not specifically in our strategic plan as it drills down probably farther than we would go, but it should be within our counseling curriculum and certainly a way that we begin to address anxiety with our kids, with our counselors working with those groups coming through, certainly with our, with our um, social workers and developing um, those and, and addressing those topics with our kids. What it also means is because it shows up in nearly every building that we probably ought to start implementing something tier one to all of our kids. Why do we have anxiety? What is it that's creating the anxiety? So that we're not, we're not dealing with small groups uh, in terms of trying to alleviate that anxiety, but we're recognizing that we have anxiety throughout and what do we need to implement whole school to try to address some of that anxiety and diminish some of that anxiety? And then for those that we don't um, meet the needs for in terms of anxiety with that whole group instruction, then we can use our, our school psychs, we can use our, our social workers, we can use our counselors to begin to address some of those anxiety issues moving forward. Yep, certainly it, is, uh, it was alarming to see. Yes. Okay, let's look at goal two. Goal two is school redesign, and school redesign is off to a, an incredible start. Flexible scheduling. So if you look at the things that were happening there, what we said we would accomplish in 18 and 19, we've accomplished all of our goals according to the strategic plan in its first year. So OMS and OHS will both be implementing their flexible scheduling expectations uh, in the coming year. Um, so you will see OMS with their drop schedule. This will allow students to take more classes then the schedule allows. So if there's a seven period day, we can find a way for students to take eight, nine, and 10 courses within that same day, meet their specific needs so that we're not telling a kid who really loves the fine arts, oops, sorry, as a seventh grader, you only get one semester and you can't participate in the others. All right, so we'll, we'll work through some of those things. Uh, and of course, you've got OHS uh, with the open hour that, is, uh, that has been piloted and now will be implemented. So 19 and 20, you can see some of those things going on as, uh, as well as in 2020 and beyond. We will continue to focus on those things. That flexible scheduling is not complete nor does it stop with the open hour and with the flexible scheduling or with the open, hour, the open hour and the drop schedule at OMS. Those things will continue. At the elementary schools, this year we'll be looking at some of what some of those flexible options will mean. What it might mean is that we develop a, a, a method for all of our fourth grade teachers to be teaching uh, reading at similar times and similar intervals. And instead of maybe being caught in silos that we might utilize 
all three of our teachers in a building or all four of our teachers in a building to help educate our kids. We can start moving some groups differently. We can do some different things there. But ultimately, that's the way we'll begin looking at that, at that flexible schedule and trying to meet the needs of our kids and from, a building, from a holistic building standpoint instead of a class-to-class -class standpoint. Um, as you scroll down to the next one, which is standards-based grading practice, you have heard that here. We're ready to implement standards-based grading at the, at the pre-K through five level. Um, they did a ton of work in a year. They did a lot of things to identify those essential standards and recognize how we might do them in a, in a, um, in a grade card type of a, a system. Uh, and we're pretty excited about what it means for this year. At six through 12, what we're really beginning to look at is grading practices, workload. We recognize that you can't come into a secondary system that has been um, A, B, C, D model with a GPA and everything is built off of that GPA and just say, oops, we're going to standards-based grading. Now, there's a lot of work there, but a big piece of it comes back through instructional practices, through workload practices, identifying essential skills, what we have to have students learn, and that'll be a big piece of our work this year coming forward. As you go to the next goal, which is um, birth to pre-K programming. So we have, we have done a lot of things here. And again, opening the pre-K center at Garfield will be a big piece of this. And most of our work comes in 19 and 20. What we tried to do this year was some things to try to get a grant that would allow us to put together a full day pre-K uh, program. Uh, the amount of money that we received in that grant wouldn't allow us to do so. So we won't see the expansion in pre-K that we wanted to see. Um, but we will begin to, um, to look at how we can do some of those things outside of grant resources and see if it's not something that we can implement uh, throughout. But again, we've met to this point, we've met the expectations of, of our pre-K uh, plan. And then the last one is individual plans of study. This one really doesn't get started until this year. And through our conversations with PLC, we have done a great deal of work there uh, to try to understand exactly what that IPS will look like and how it will follow kids day to day. So again, the four pieces of um, of the strategic plan in terms of school redesign have been met in their first year. This is a big goal. This is something that we talked about. This is something that, um, that there was some skepticism as to whether or not we could accomplish all of these things that we had set out to accomplish. And I think that what we have shown is that our staff is incredible. Our administrative team is incredible. They've put forth a great deal of work to accomplish these goals. And these are things that they are passionate about and feel strongly about, which is why we've seen the success there that we've had. The last one is goal one, and this is about student learning, and this is, this is what I really wanted to express in terms of the other things that you're beginning to see. So you've heard from me about um, instructional framework, you've heard from me about curriculum, and you've heard from me uh, about PLC framework. So our goal is about student learning, student, um, student uh, skills, student behavior, knowledge, skills, behavior. Right? What we've recognized in looking at our scores is we're, we're doing okay. Right? Kids are meeting their growth, but not in all areas. We're still behind in some areas. As we started taking a look at, at, um, at our scores, what we've recognized is that we have not done our due diligence as a system to ensure teacher success. Part of that is that we do not have a documented, verified, adopted by the board curriculum in any area other than some things through BYOC at high school, science at the elementary school. And, and I don't think there's anything else, right? You did FOSS and science last year. There is nothing else. Okay, so when a new teacher comes to our district and says, hey, I am your seventh grade ELA teacher what do I do? We have little to nothing to help support them in their first year. Even if they're an experienced teacher coming in with 20 years of experience coming to our district, we don't have any of those things to provide. BYOC never made it through to fruition at the, at the six through eight level. Reading and math worked some different ways there and we started transitioning um, resources and so we've not had those things at the elementary level. We do have science ready to go, which is, a, which is a huge deal. And at the secondary level, 
even though we have them in BYOC, not being followed very well in BYOC is really just a bad word for our teachers these days. Um, and, and so we've got, to, we've got to do some different things there. In order to help our staff be as successful as they can possibly be, we have to have the foundation in place for them to know exactly what we need to teach every day. It is not about taking away autonomy, but it is about taking the opportunity to, uh, to identify the essential standards that are a must for our students to learn each and every day, and that those things are aligned pre-K through 12, and that we do not have gaps in our curriculum that lead to a lack of student achievement. So when you hear me talk about curricular framework, it comes back to goal one in student learning. We believe that the way that we are going to best improve the assessment scores that you saw is by ensuring that we have a sound, viable curriculum that has been approved by the board that we can help our teachers implement each day, day in and day out. So the second piece of that, again, as we come down and, and we're trying to, to meet our goals, is that we don't have anything in place that helps a teacher identify what our expectations of them are in the classroom other than our evaluation document, which doesn't do a whole lot to help the improvement or identify areas of positivity or improvement with our staff. Right, so the evaluation document is a, is a fine document for evaluation terms. It is not an instructional framework. It is not something that we can look at in terms of the three facets of instruction, the planning piece, the teaching piece, and the reflection piece. Right, so the expectations of our staff differ based upon who you ask because it has never been explicitly provided to them of what it means to be a teacher in USD 290 and what our expectations are. Several years ago, we had some conversations about classroom instruction that works. I would imagine that Mrs. Bridges here remembers some of the things from classroom instruction that works. I would imagine some of our principals remember they were implemented about five years ago and I would guess have not been brought up since. Okay. So what we have done for the past few years is simply leave teachers to their own devices. And we have some really great teachers, and you can see from our scores, they're doing some really great things. In order for us to go to the next level, we have to be very explicit about what our expectations are. If this is what we're doing here, how do we improve? These are the steps that we can improve upon. That's what the instructional framework is for. In order for us to really get better, to meet our demands on student achievement, to really get to the points where we say we are the best school in the state of Kansas, which has been the goal, right? If you remember when we took over, we started with, we want to be the des best district in the league. We want to be the best district, uh, start in the county, league, best district on the eastern side of the state, best district in the state. In order for us to do those things, we have to be very explicit in terms of what we need from our staff to get to that point. Now the question is, how do we do it? A curriculum overhaul is a lot of work. A change in instructional framework is a lot of work. This is where the PLC framework comes into play, that the collaborative time will be very, um, will be very distinct in terms of the direction that we put out there. Here is what we need to accomplish today, starting with our curricular objectives, identifying what the essential standards for our district are and what our needs are for our kids. But I wanted you, as we talk about these things that are coming in place, I wanted to make sure that one, you see that our strategic plan is, is really working well. The things that we have put in there, we are beginning to address. Our teachers believe in it, they've had a part in creating it, and we see the success that we've had through there. But these new initiatives that are coming into place, whether we're talking about curriculum, whether we're talking about instructional framework, talking about PLC framework, we're talking about our work with TASN and intervention. They're all intertwined in this document and each one of those things has a distinct expectation and a reasoning for us to do this work to ensure that we have the student success and achievement that we set out to, to acquire when we started this plan. So that is what we're doing. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of different things, and I'm sure that, again, we will be met with some skepticism as to whether or not we can accomplish all of these tasks. But in order for us to be the best that we can be, it isn't, it isn't a matter of whether we can or we can't. It is a matter of having to. We have to do these things in order to be the best we can for our kids. And that's where we're going to be, and we're pretty excited about doing it.
Any questions on strategic plan? The, the only question I have is how are we going to, on standard-based grading, how are we going to educate our parents, especially uh, middle school, high school parents, on what that is? I think the elementary parents yep. are kind of it's funny. It's funny that you ask because a lot of that has already started. So you might be amazed the number of parents that hate our grading system, that believe that it is subjective, that it differs from teacher to teacher, that, um, that kids are held accountable in different ways. And there is a great deal of frustration that goes along with it. And every time we have one of those parents that come in, and you saw data that showed our, our failure rate, right, at OHS and OMS. So we have a lot of conversations with parents about grades. Every time we do, we begin to have the conversation about what we can do from a standards-based platform versus a percentage uh, point attainment platform. These conversations are being had already, and there is a shift and parental desire for us um, that is already beginning to occur. The more difficult piece will be our teachers uh, and really recognizing that they have to change an instructional strategy and a grading strategy to meet a, um, a, a district expectation and a more, um, a more congruent expect expectation across all fronts that you take away here's the way that I grade things and here's the way that I can hold people accountable um, to what we do based upon our grading system. So from a parent standpoint, those conversations are already starting. From a teacher standpoint, where it begins with solid instructional practices, making sure that we've identified exactly what we want to teach, common assessments throughout, we will start with these things. Workload would be another one. We will start with these things to get to a point where standards-based grading just makes sense. Well, it does make sense. Yes, except, it will. But, but that piece, you know, the, the extra credit piece is going yeah. to blow everybody's mind, yes. you know, not having that. But if you're in a true standards-based grading model, there should be no need for extra credit right. because there's constant reteaching. So anything that you don't perform well, you have the opportunity to reteach, relearn, and retake. So the need for extra credit would go away. So that blows minds on, some, on, on both fronts, right? Those that have always utilized extra credit to get where they need to be, and those that say, under no circumstances will there be any extra credit, you have one-time assessment in my class, and that's it. So w it will blow the minds of both ends of the spectrum. Um, but again, in the end, if what is most important is student learning, and that we identify that, that, that before we leave the end of the first quarter, st students have to know this standard, this standard, this standard, and this standard. That whether it takes a kid three weeks or three days to learn it shouldn't really matter. That what really matters is at the end that they learn it. How that happens within that time frame shouldn't be the most significant piece. And we shouldn't just say, here's unit one, we've made it, now start unit two, and we don't revisit unit one again. That is a change of instructional practice and one that is going to uh, not be easy to overcome, but certainly one that uh, I think we have enough people in our system that believe in that, that it, will, it will allow us to begin to make some of those changes. Can you explain what GPA will look like after this? No, because I don't know. Um, which, is, which is ultimately why we haven't, we haven't had the standards-based conversation in the same manner that we've had at elementary at the secondary level. What it, it could look like, and what it has looked like for other districts that have implemented um, standards-based grading at the secondary level, is that um, if, you, if you identify your, um, your expectations as uh, exceeds, um, meets, what it, four, you create four different sections. So exceeds would be a four, um, meets is a three, approaches is a two, and whatever is a one. And then if you don't meet, maybe it's a whatever. You can create points off of the same expectations and still create a GPA. You are starting to hear universities now say that GPA is not near as big a deal. They're recognizing that standards-based grading is changing, and you're even beginning to get some uh, university professors to move to a standards-based system. I don't care when you show me that you know these things, but by the end of the semester, you have to show me that you know these things. Um, so we'll, we'll play ring around the rosy for a little while. 
Um, but in the end, I think that you're seeing a shift across the state uh, in terms of what standards-based grading practices look like and how ultimately they will affect. But it is a great question and one that we don't know the answer to yet. But we will continue to push until we do know it. I've had a question uh, on the open hour at the high school. Uh, what if students, just because they're there is uh, internet access at the high school and perhaps they don't have it at home what if they choose to like take an online class a college online class or something can they do that Terrific. at open hour I had three parents contact me about that and if a kid chooses to extend their learning during that time mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of what I thought, but uh, that, I mean, that's a good thing. Yeah. It's a really Absolutely. wonderful thing. Yeah. And it's no different than some of our kids who they enroll in college classes. Like we have a, had a large group of kids enroll in political terminology, and they kind of took that independently. And we gave them an independent study, and they were in the media center for that hour. And they took that course through the Neosha Community College last year during second semester. So in my opinion, it would be very similar to that. It would just be using that open hour to take an additional class on top of the seven they can enroll in. That's great. Okay. Okay. Any other questions on strategic plan? As goal four states, we did have our admin team go through and update the strategic plan and make revisions. I will I will put those together for you all and send it out to you, and we'll um, we'll present and then uh, have board approve new and updated strategic plan. But we'll continue to do that biannually. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cobbs, and I think you might as well stay there because you're going to yeah. uh, talk with us about the first read of the elementary. Uh, everybody oh, loves yeah. handbook it's time. It's my favorite time of the year. Is, so the good thing about this year is there are almost no changes to these two sets of handbooks. Our elementary handbooks take care of um, all of our elementary, Sunflower, Garfield, and Lincoln. So if you look at the one that just says changes, the um, nope, fourth one from the bottom, or fourth one to the bottom. <laughs> there you go. Uh, it really just addresses the grading system. So movement uh, from, a, from your previous reporting standard to standards-based grading. Um, that's really all that addresses, uh, as well as takes out uh, Ames Web and moves to FastBridge. Uh, so nothing other to change in our elementary handbooks. Um, and then the, um, the middle school changes, which are right there. Or very many. Um, Talk about change in safety drills, so you should have seen this in the update that they've moved from 16 to 9, which is a good thing. Uh, so I think that's um, three fire drills, two tornado drills, and four safety drills, I think, throughout the course of the year. Um, the other thing that they changed is that earning 20 points does not lead to a mandatory um, long-term suspension hearing, which is what the handbook previously stated that if you hit 20 points, you were coming to a hearing here. It gives the administrator some discretion to say whether or not they think a hearing is, is required uh, based upon the behavior of those students. Uh, and then it adds um, that the uh, Friday night school changes based upon um, our early release system. The other thing they did, it took out AVID because there are no more AVID courses at the middle school. So those are your changes to your middle school and elementary handbooks. We will get high school and SPED and alternative all within the next, the next few meetings. Okay. Any questions? No. Okay. All right, moving on to 6.02, resolution to extend term of board officers. All right, so the, um, the change in the law to, to move um, the, uh, the election process from the summer to the fall uh, has ultimately changed some other aspects of, of board process, um, one of which is where the, um, the voting of, of board officers lies. So typically we would be voting on new board officers in July. However, what that might mean is that um, some of our officers may be um, replaced uh, due to the election. Uh, the other thing that, that this resolution would allow us to do is make some decisions that, that leave the choice of, um, 
of who the president and the vice president are in the hands of the board and not dictated by previous uh, expectations that only those that were not up for election or only those that had done this or that were able to be or were able to perform those duties. The, the reality of the board president should align itself with the will of the board and those uh, that the board believes are best suited for those positions and ultimately it leaves it in the hands of you all to make that decision. What this resolution does is allows uh, Linda and Julie to both remain in their positions until January when the board would then vote upon uh, board president and vice president again as a whole um, with everybody in their elected seat uh, for at least the next two years. And this is something the city's done too because of elections and city has done it and this uh, came directly from uh, kasb as a resolution because a number of districts had asked for the same resolution trying to address this need uh, and so it was it was pretty simple they just sent it straight to me and we're not the only ones in this boat well madam president i move that uh, we approve the resolution to extend the term of board officers uh, the resolution reads, be resolved that the Board of Education of Unified School District Number 290, Franklin County, Kansas, hereby extends the term of current Board President Julie Dandrew and the current Board Vice President Linda Alderman until successors for such positions are elected by the Board in the first meeting of the Board occurring on or after the second Monday of January 2020. Second. Is there any discussion before we vote? All right, all in favor, please raise your right hand. Yes, 6-0. Yep. Yep. I would ask that after the meeting, I have the resolution uh, on, my, on my desk over there, if you just make sure that we sign it so there's a signed copy of it that, that Terry will take care of um, in the end. Okay, moving on to 6.03, transition of OMS OHS bank account. Yeah, so this is the last thing, and again, we, we identified this in the, in the update. Uh, for whatever reason, um, the middle school and the high school have been on different accounts than the district office has been. Um, I, again, I think initially it was when we had a number of locally owned banks to try to distribute services throughout uh, to create partnerships with, with all of those banks. Um, as we've had banks transition in and out of locally owned to more national um, style banks, what it has, what, how it has impacted us is that in order to transition money between a district account and any of the uh, activity accounts at OHS or OMS, we have to write a check. They have to take it there, deposit it, wait for it to come in, or vice versa, they have to do the same thing. Where if we were all under Kansas State Bank's umbrella, then we get into our bank account and we just transfer money digitally and be done with it. So the amount of time that we would save is fairly significant. The amount of money that we'd save in terms of checks is fairly significant. And the ease of utilizing the bank account uh, would, would certainly uh, impact us positively. The other side of that is Kansas State Bank has been a fantastic partner to our schools. Uh, and, and Roger Maxwell and everybody else at Kansas State Bank have really been a, a vital part of, of some of the things that we've been able to do there, and they've certainly earned our business um, and would make a, a, a much better transition for us moving forward. Madam President, I move that we approve the transition from Bank Midwest to Kansas State Bank for OHS and OMS accounts. Second. Is there any discussion before we vote? All right, all in favor, please raise your right hand. Passes 6-0. Thank you. All right, you've all been presented with a personnel report. Um, is there a motion to approve tonight's personnel report? So move. Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. And that passes 6-0. And we are down to announcements. All right, again, I uh, want to thank our principals for coming in and reporting tonight. They've done a fantastic job at our buildings. We've got lots of work left to do, but... Um, we really have some great buildings and great teachers uh, doing some wonderful things for our kids. So thank, thank the three of you and Mrs. Bridges. Thanks for being here tonight. We always appreciate you being here. A uh, couple of things. One, happy 4th of July. It's almost 4th of July weekend. It snuck up on us, I think, uh, but it is, it is just around the corner. First Friday would typically be on the 5th. 
Um, and because that's 4th of July weekend, I think they recognize that not very many people would attend. And so uh, the chamber has moved first Friday uh, to the 12th. Uh, so it's actually second Friday for them uh, for the month of July. Uh, the budget workshop will take place on July 8th at uh, Shawnee Heights. Uh, Terry and I and Josh will be attending that um, and certainly look forward to hearing how uh, the Supreme Court ruling is going to impact us moving forward and look forward to getting the budget season over and on to just normal things uh, again. Our TASN meeting, you heard multiple people talk about TASN takes place on August 9th. They're really going to come in and break down data for us again uh, so we can, we can really start talking about our district-wide data, what it really means, uh, and looking at um, mean versus median counts and, and um, really trying to identify where we are struggling within our curriculum um, and, and why we're seeing gaps there. So that will certainly be uh, an interesting conversation. And then our admin team is actually off uh, for the next month. They, their last day was on Friday. Um, even though it is not July yet, we traded uh, the last week of June for the last week in July so that when our admin team returns that they are not inundated with coming back and, and having to do enrollment. So uh, they will be gone for the next month, but will return July 25th um, as we start getting ready for the new school year, which is really only about a month away. Uh, so it's moving pretty fast. <laughs> That's what we have for it's announcements. Speeding it up. So, yep. All right, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? So move. Is there a second? No, they just Okay, second. second. All in favor, raise your right hand. Yeah, I know. Yes. Oh, we have to vote. Yes, all right, pass the six up. Yeah, I just kind of